During the early years of my career as a sheriff deputy, there was this one investigation that became incredibly unsettling, and it had stayed with me all these years later. We received a call about a young person sleeping in a car at the end of a dirt road. The owner of the property mentioned that technically, the individual was trespassing, but he didn't want to report it that way. He expressed concern that the young person seemed distressed and might need someone to check on them. So that's what I did. I drove out to the location where the young person's car was, and when I say young person, they were probably in their late teens or early 20s. When I found the car, I checked the license plate to see if any information came up. As it turned out, that young person was reported as missing, and the car belonged to their extremely worried mother. This discovery provided some reassurance, and I believed that I would likely be able to convince them to go back home. If they were cooperative, I would simply let them continue on their way. However, if they decided to be difficult, I could detain them for trespassing. Either way, I thought the problem would be resolved. I approached this person's car slowly and noticed them reclined all the way back in the front passenger seat. I gently tapped on the window, keeping my hand close to my sidearm. As they woke up, I made sure to greet them with a friendly smile and a playful, Wakey wakey buddy, do you mind if we have a little... I didn't finish my sentence because I realized that that young person wasn't paying attention. Their eyes widened to the point where it seemed like they might pop out of their head. And I watched the color drain from their face before I suddenly saw a gun in their hand. Instinctively, my training kicked in and I swiftly moved back while drawing my own weapon. I shouted, drop the gun, drop the gun, repeatedly. And it all happened too quickly for me to fully comprehend what I was witnessing. But in one fluid motion, they bit down on the barrel, pulled the trigger, and took their own life. Still trembling from the rush of adrenaline, I waited for backup and EMTs to arrive in an attempt to save that young person's life. But unfortunately, there wasn't anything I could do. They were pronounced dead at the scene, and it fell upon me to deliver the heartbreaking news to their mother. That was one of the most difficult tasks I have ever faced, and it left me shaken for quite some time. Unfortunately, everything I have shared so far, as weighty as it was, is not the reason why I am constantly reminded of what had happened. It's the information I learned afterward that truly terrified me. I managed to obtain a copy of this person's missing person report, which essentially contained all the details their mother provided on the day they went missing. She said she woke up in the middle of the night and smelled smoke. She got out of bed and quickly discovered the smoke was coming from a trash can fire in her backyard. She went downstairs, filled a bucket of water and then threw it over the fire to extinguish the flame. Then, correctly assuming that it was her son who started the fire, she went looking for him to confront him. And that's when she discovers that not only is her child missing, but her car is missing too. She dials 911 to report him missing right away, and later that morning, she starts trying to figure out what her child had been burning. It was his computer, and from the looks of it, a bunch of his clothes too. They were all severely burned, so not easily recognizable, but a quick check of his bedroom was enough to figure out what was missing. I learned all that when I delivered the bad news, and when the mother had shared everything she possibly could with me, she was incredibly brave by the way. She asked, what should I do next? Since there was no evidence of any crime being actually committed, the decision was essentially hers. I told her that if I were in her shoes, I would try to recover the data from his computer's hard drive, if possible, as it would likely provide some clue as to why her son did what he did. And apart from that, I had no idea what I would do in her position. To lose a child like that, in such sudden and mysterious circumstances, I can't even imagine the pain that must have been. So, in the end, all I could do was tell her to call me if she needed anything and offered her my deepest condolences. Months passed, and I handled hundreds of other calls, and the story of that kid faded into the background of my thoughts. And then one day, the mother called me with some news. In the immediate aftermath of her son's death, one of the first things she needed to do was have her car cleaned. 
Obviously, a private company was hired to do the job with instructions to put everything that wasn't too blood-stained into a large black duffel bag so the mother could sort through it later. It took her a while to get around to it, knowing that most of the stuff would be the clutter that had been lying around her car. But when she finally got to it, she found an old menu flyer from some diner up in Oregon. She had never been to Oregon, and as far as she knew, neither had her son, so she was obviously confused. Then, on the back, there were two phone numbers, one for a fixed landline and one for a cell phone. She called the fixed landline first to find it disconnected, but after typing it into Google, she found out it was registered to some shipping company that claimed to be permanently closed. Then she tried calling the cell phone number, and this time, the line started to ring, and someone eventually answered. She said the person sounded male, older, with some kind of accent, and then when she mentioned her son, the person hung up on her. She tried calling back, but the phone wouldn't ring, and she tried again later, but it was disconnected. She appeared convinced that the secretive man and the bankrupt shipping company had some involvement in her son's death, and if her account is true, I can't blame her at all. However, since there was no evidence of any wrongdoing, our department couldn't take any action. Unlike our initial conversation, I wasn't as eager to suggest a private investigator this time. Whatever she had discovered, it was significant and dangerous, and she was clearly in over her head. I used to believe that the uncertainty would be her downfall, but I later realized that uncovering the truth might also be fatal for her. If you enjoyed this scary story, listen to thousands more, either over on the Let's Read YouTube channel or podcast.